Hey, it's Greg Stanley. If you're listening to this podcast, you know I love everything automotive. This passion has expanded to include being a car specialist consultant for RM Sotheby's. So if you need assistance buying or consigning a collector car at any one of our online or live auctions, including Scottsdale, Amelia Island, or Monterey, you can reach one of our car specialists at rmsotheby's.com or you can email me directly at gstanley at rmsotheby's.com. This is the Collector Car Podcast, the home for the auto enthusiast. Join Greg Stanley as he applies over 25 years of insights and analytical experience to the collector car market. He will interview the experts and throw in some fun stuff as well. Welcome to another week of automotive fun stuff here at the Collector Car Podcast. Hey, it's Greg Stanley. This week, I am going to pick my supercars for the ultimate supercar garage. Now, this is going to be very difficult. And I know I will upset a lot of you, so I apologize for that up front. I do want to know what picks would be in your ultimate supercar garage, so please shoot me a note on Instagram at the Collector Car Podcast when you see the cover art for this podcast, or shoot me a note directly at gstanley at rmsotheby's.com. Now, just as a reminder, you have 10 spots in which to pick your ultimate supercars. Price is no object, but you only have 10 spots, and that's where it becomes very difficult. <laughs> now, this is for you. You don't have to pick the 10 best supercars ever made. That's not a lot of fun. It's more about what is interesting to you that you would like to have in your ultimate garage. Now, before we get to the ultimate supercar garage, I need to thank this show's sponsor, who is in the business of building ultimate garages. Metron Garage is a company designing unique garages, condos, and other structures specifically for the auto enthusiast. They've got eight models to choose from, including two-story options, all with a very modern look and feel to them. I've gone on and on about a couple of the models I really enjoy, so be sure to go to metrongarage.com to check them all out. They come in all sizes, and they're fully customizable. What is really cool is that they have all the functionality you'd want in a garage, plus the bonus of comfortable social or living space with your favorite vehicles. So like I said, you can check them out today and start specking your own ultimate garage at metrongarage.com where you can request a catalog or talk to someone to learn more. So before we get to the ultimate supercar garage, I do want to call out a few things I missed in last week's episode, analog supercars. There's two very obvious ones I missed, and I appreciate you giving me a heads up about this. Actually, I missed two cars that are American-built cars, the Saline S7, which is wicked looking, and the Vector Supercars. Now, Vector, they had two generations. One of them was, uh, I think it was called the W8, and then the second gen was early 90s. It kind of looked like a whale shark. They're still really cool, and I just happened to be in the presence of one last week. You can go to my Instagram feed and see that one, uh, which is here. Actually, there's two of them in Cincinnati of the 14 second generation Vectors, which is really cool. For my ultimate supercar garage, I wanted a diversity in eras and driving experience. So while I could pick 10 Ferraris from the 2000s to today, I've chosen to include picks from five decades, four different countries, and with multiple different power plants. Now the first one is the granddaddy of supercars, and this will help define what I consider a supercar, and that is the 1971 Lamborghini Miura SV. So I did not count anything that was built prior to the launch of the Lamborghini Miura in 1967 as a supercar. You can feel free to argue with me on that point. Now from Auto Week, if you want to trace the history of the modern supercar, you would likely end right here with the 1966 introduction of the Lamborghini Miura. It was remarkable not only for the Marcello Gandini design body, but for the amazing feat of cramming a V12 engine and transmission sideways behind the two seats. As such, it was the first successful mass-produced supercar, and the world has never been the same. In an article from the Complex, they state the Mura is the forefather of all the two-seat mid-engine supercars we have today. It also started the tradition of V12 mid-engine Lamborghinis that will fling a driver into a canyon if he's not careful. As nuts as that is, there's something charming about that sort of purity. The Mura was simply the fastest and most engaging car that Lamborghini could build. At the time of its introduction, it was the fastest production car in the world, and the Bertone bodywork stood the test of time far better than its successor, the Countach. Now, originally I had a Countach as one of my 10 cars, but it is so similar to the Mura, I didn't really have enough spots to warrant two of them. Now, Haggerty states, an upgraded version, the Mura S, appeared in the beginning of 1969, 
and 140 of these were built. Now the Mira SV, the third and final variant of the supercar was the Mira SV, which is the one I picked for this list, of which 120 were built. The SV had widened rear bodywork in order to, co to accommodate larger tires, and as expected, further engine modifications yielded 385 horsepower. The SV can be readily identified by, the, by its lack of fins or eyebrows around the headlights, and the later SV also finally had separate oil supply for the transaxle and engine, eliminating the potential for gearbox metal circulating through the engine, which that's a good thing. So let's see, the Haggerty three-year trend on this car is up 29, I'm sorry, is up 28.9%. Now the second car on my supercar list is probably the most obvious one. It's the 1998 McLaren F1 LM. Now AutoWeek states the Garn Murray designed McLaren F1 is considered by many, if not most, to be the greatest supercar ever built. The ranking remains even more than 20 years after the first one was built, but the LM specification is greater still even among F1s. It makes 680 horsepower up from 618 horsepower in the other F1s and hits only 225 miles per hour because of its aerodynamic bodywork is aimed at greater downforce instead of straight line speed. It will be a joy to compare the performance of this icon with Murray's coming T50. Can't wait. Now that's the last truly analog supercar which is coming out in 2021 or 2022 that I mentioned in last week's episode. Okay, the Complex has an article, and they state, What isn't to like about the F1? McLaren's anal retentive ethos shows through in every aspect of the car, from the gold-plated for heat dispersion, BMW V12, to the groundbreaking active aerodynamic effects. When it debuted, it was the fastest and most expensive car in the world, but the goal was to simply be the best road car in the world. We still can't think of anything we'd rather have. Also, who doesn't love the seating arrangement? One central driver's seat with two passenger seats set back and to the sides is brilliant. More like this, please. Now, the three-year trend on the McLaren F1 LM is up 51.4%, and they trade around $20 million. Okay, now my next one was going to be the Ferrari F40, but I had to boot it, mostly because it's of the same era, probably has the same visceral driving feel of the McLaren F1, and like I said, there's only 10 spots, so it has to go. I love the Ferrari F40. Now, this one might be a little controversial because it is a newer car, but I picked the 2017 Ferrari F12 TDF. I just think this is one of the prettiest Ferraris ever built. There's a lot of Ferraris I don't like. I don't think they're that good looking, <laughs> but this one really is awesome. And when I looked at my list overall, I believe all 10 cars were rear-engined. And I really wanted a front-engine V12 Ferrari. So this is the one that made the list. If Ferrari is best known and beloved for one style of vehicle, it would be the brand's rich lineage of front-engine naturally aspirated V12s. Yet even as naturally aspirated performance cars begin to die off in the 2010s in favor of turbocharging, the Ferrari F12 held, to the fa held fast to the purest formula. The F12 Berlinetta launched in 2012 as a replacement for the 599 and by 2015, Ferrari re revealed its ultimate track slain evolution, the F12 TDF. When new, the heavily upgraded TDF, those last three initials stand for Tour de France, referring to a series of competition models during Ferrari's endurance racing dominance in the 1950s and 60s, costing roughly $490,000 before options. Before long, however, used examples started trading for much higher prices, including one that the drive reportedly sold for $1.5 million in 2016. At its 2019 Fort Lauderdale sale, RM Sotheby's sold a gorgeous white over red F12 TDF with fewer than 900 miles on the clock for $975,000. So what is it about the F12 TDF that makes it appreciate basically right out of the gate? Now, compared to the standard F12, the TDF 6.3 liter V12 spits out a brutal 769 horsepower at 8,500 RPMs. If that weren't enough, Ferrari also shaved almost 250 pounds from the curb weight, helping lob off 0.2 seconds from the 0 to 60 mile per hour sprint, which took just 2.9 seconds. Now, the three year trend on this car is actually down 11.5%, mostly because it's still depreciating as a new car. And as there are some one-off sales above sticker price, that is probably turning around here fairly quickly. Now, the next car is also a fairly new car, 
the McLaren 720S Spider. Again, l- largely for the same reason. I think M- McLaren really hit it out of the park with the design of this car, especially the Spider, and they are just wicked cars to drive. Now, Autocar states the McLaren 720S has succeeded where both of its predecessors, the 650S and the MP4 12C, fell short in our supercar class chart purely and simply by topping it. There are few more direct, effective ways for cars in this stratum of the performance car market to demonstrate their superiority than by accelerating faster, lapping quicker, and stopping harder than any rival. The 720S does, does all three. In many of the performance benchmarks that road testers are used to measuring, in fact, the 710 horsepower Blockbuster is a closer match for a contemporary hypercar than one of its mid-engine components. Now, there isn't a trend line for this one because it is too new. Okay, number five. I picked the 2005 or 2006 Ford GT, not the Heritage Edition. Now, Autocar states, the myth and mystique of the Ford GT stretching back more than five decades to the GT40 string of successful victories at Le Mans would have given this car a larger-than-life presence in any class in which we put it and lends it an appeal that's utterly unique and difficult to quantify. Originally resurrected in 2005, this third coming of a motoring legend is a cleverly conceived road-going version of Ford's World Endurance Championship Racer. Available on left-hand drive only, it has a chassis and suspension more exotic than almost any rival, and an engine adopted from that of F-150 pickup truck. Now, I did not pick the Heritage Edition just because I'm not crazy about the Gulf Oil, you know, with the gumball sticker on the side, driving around every day in one of those. They're super cool. They're super iconic for sure. And the Heritage Edition are the ones that are up about 10% when you look at the Haggerty trends, while the non-Heritage Editions are down, I believe it was 3 or 4%. Okay, number six is the Porsche Carrera GT, also known shorthand as the CGT. This is from the DuPont Registry. With a six-speed manual transmission and wooden cue ball shift knob, it's understandable why many call the Carrera GT the last of the analog supercars. Absent the sophisticated safety system of today's latest and greatest, the mid-engine GT is a thrill ride offering a taste of what might have been had Porsche set the GT site on the racetrack. A 5.7 liter V8 develops 603 horsepower and has a sound like no other Porsche engine ever made. The Carrera GT does not suffer fools requiring skill when engaging its sensitive clutch and commanding respect when managing the rear wheel horsepower. Its shape, the handiwork of Porsche's then lead designer, Harm Laga, seems timeless and almost understated today. A total of 1,270 units were made between 2004 and 2007. Now, the three-year trend line for this car is up 9.4%, and like I said, it has a 305-horsepower V10 engine in the back. All right, number seven. Now, originally, this was a 2005 Bugatti Veyron, four turbos and an 8-liter W16, and it's the first car with a four-digit power rating and million-dollar price tag. So overwhelmingly ambitious and insanely equipped, insanely equipped, it is the ultimate supercar to which all others must be compared. That is from Edmonds, and I can't agree more, so that would make a lot of sense to have it in my ultimate supercar garage. But I think the following car, the Bugatti Chiron 2010, is basically the Veyron turned to 11. It looks a lot better, has even more horsepower. Now this is, I believe, also from Edmonds. The Bugatti Chiron is not all about the sum of its glorious parts. Sure, one can marvel at the 1,500 horsepower W16 engine, or coo over the Art Deco-inspired exterior, or rave about the jewel-like interior, but to separate out these ingredients is to miss the, miss the majesty of the meal. The Chiron, named after the famed driver Louis Chiron, is at once a vehicle from the future and a modern reincarnation of the 1930s Bugatti Type 57 SE Atlantic. To pull up somewhere in a Chiron is the unequivocal calling card that says you've arrived, not just in your destination, but in life. All right, that's a little cheesy. I almost put the 1935 Bugatti Type 57 on here as the actual first supercar, which folks can really make the strong argument for, but then it kind of skewed my whole logic, so I I said, nah. So that is why I would pick the Bugatti Chiron. All right, number eight. This is controversial because I just kept on going back and forth. Does it deserve a spot? Does it not? It is the Lamborghini Aventador SVJ. Now, a lot of these cars are from the mid to late 2000s. Interesting. 
All right, Autocar said a drive in the 12-cylinder mid-engine series production flagship supercar isn't something you'll forget. The Aventador line goes all the way back through Murciago, Diablo, Countach, and the legendary Mura, which we mentioned earlier. And it's a car with the stunning looks and full-blooded naked aggression to hold its own, even in comparison with its ancestor. It bursts onto the scene with almost 700 atmospheric, horse, atmospheric horsepower in four-wheel drive five years ago at the time that this was written. And it and was updated to S specifications in 2017 to include four-wheel steering and even more grunt. Now we have the heroic SVJ, which takes an already unmissable car and turns it into the world's greatest attention magnet thanks to an astonishing body kit. The engine, which makes 759 horsepower at 8,500 RPM, is stupendous, even if its battle shift gearbox isn't always worthy of it. It does feel hugely wide on the road and is still a sledgehammer of an instrument on the track, although it has developed greater handling, delicacy, and balance in later life. As for drama, off the scale. Yeah, like I said, that one I went back and forth on, but I'm like, I have an early Lambo. It'd be nice to have a later one because they're so iconic and the angles looks like a jet fighter for the street. I've always loved them. All right, two more to go, and honestly, both of these will be controversial as well. Number nine, I picked the Pagani Zonda F. This is from Wikipedia. The Zonda F de- debuted at the 2005 Geneva Motor Show. It was the most extensive re-engineering variant of the Zonda yet, though it shared much with its predecessors, including the 7.3 AMG V12 engine with thorough enhanced intake manifolds, exhaust, and a revised ECU now how I had a power output of 594 horsepower at 6,200 RPM. That doesn't seem like a lot when I'm talking about 7,800 in some of these other cars. Production of the Zonda F was limited to 25 cars. It came equipped with an extra headlight and a new configuration of fog lights in the lower grill, new bodywork that improved the car's aerodynamics and different side mirrors. Now the one I would want is the Zonda Roadster F, which debuted at the 2006 Geneva Motor Show. Power output of the engine was increased to 641 horsepower, that's more like it, and 575 pound-feet of torque. Production of the F of the Roadster F was limited to 25 units. Because these are so rare and you never, ever see them trade publicly for the most part, uh, there are no trends. There isn't any type of market trend on this car. All right, the last one is bound to be <laughs> controversial as well. When I looked at my picks so far, I realized... Uh, I didn't really have like a true supercar that had kind of the muscle car feel to it that was big and brash but still beautiful. And so for my last car, I picked the Sailing S7. Now this is from DuPont Registry. An American outlier in a world of European trend centers, Steve Sailing's S7 debuted in 2000 at the Monterey Historic Races as a track-focused supercar that was far more extreme than most competitors from the other side of the pond. The heart of the mid-engine Predator was an aluminum power plant derived from Ford's venerable 351 V8, which developed 550 horsepower and shifted through a six-speed transmission. I didn't mention this before, but I would want the twin turbo version. The subsequent model S7 twin turbo from 2005 made 750 horsepower from a 427 big block V8 and achieved a claimed top speed of 248 miles an hour Staggering performance then and now. Produced through 2009, the Saline F7 remains a rare collectible, and while no production figures are officially available, its numbers are estimated to be well below triple digits. Now, the three-year trend via Haggerty is up 27.8%. And like I said, this is a twin-turbo 750 horsepower 427 V8. So there we have it. American, Italian, British, and French? I question French because Bugatti is an Italian guy who built a French car, which is now owned by the Germans. Yeah, so that's French, right? So I I am sorry, there are no Asian cars that made the list here. I looked at the Nissan GTR. It does have supercar performance, but I would not call that a supercar. I'm open for comments and opinions on that. I also wanted to have an accurate NSX. Honestly, The first gen would have been my first choice. Uh, I helped sell one at Monterey last year. It was Monaco Blue. That would have been my first choice. But I'm like, you know what? Am I looking at an accurate NSX from the late 1990s versus, you know, Lamborghini Gallardo, Performante? That was another one that was on my list that got cut. 
or you know any of the 458 Ferraris. I just couldn't get it into the top 10. Now, some other ones that were cut to make room, as I mentioned, the Gallardo Performante, a Lamborghini Aventador was cut. Uh, I did cut the Vector W8, the first gen of the Vector. Just those things aren't really reliable, even though they look totally awesome. And then there were some others that were kind of outliers, and I really wanted a spot. The Maserati MC12, which is basically a nicer version of the Ferrari Enzo. Koenigsegg, I couldn't get them on there. And then we had some one-offs. The Aston Martin 177. That's really cool. I didn't pick any of the 2015 Halo cars. The Ferrari La Ferrari that was on there initially, but I decided to put the TDF on there instead. McLaren P1, I couldn't really justify that. Or the new Speedtail, even though that's our cover art, as the F1 was the granddaddy to both of those. I also had the Porsche 918 with the Vysok package, but I had to take that one off because I already had the Carrera GT. Lexus LFA, I guess that could have been my Asian supercar. That thing was pretty cool. Uh, Viper ACRs, I just don't see those as supercars. McLaren Senna, that looks like a bug. Mercedes McLaren SLRs, the Countach 959s, XJ220s, EB110s. Those are all ones that I considered, but I had to get them off of the list. Now, I, you know, now that I think about this, I probably should have had the Lexus LFA on there. That's an incredible, again, V10 supercar. Maybe the Nuremberg edition, which they only made like 50 of them. That would probably be my number 11. Maybe switch that out with the Lamborghini I just mentioned. Anyways, I would appreciate your comments. Uh, feel free to reach out. Give me some ideas for what you would like to see in the future. Huge response in the analog supercar, so I appreciate that. appreciate you reaching out to me. The more I know what you like, what you want to hear about, the more I can give it to you. So as always, keep your hands on the wheels, tire straight, and foot on the gas. And I will talk to all of you next week. Thanks for listening to the Collector Car Podcast. Don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes and be sure to follow us on Instagram and everywhere else at the Collector Car Podcast.